All right. So once again, if you uh, if you missed yesterday on uh, on the pressure units, I strongly recommend you go through the lecture on the Google Classroom. Um, but here they are. So. One atmosphere is 101,000 pascals, 14.7 psi, 760 millimeters of mercury. And if we ever need to convert, we're going to be using temperature today. If you ever need to convert temperatures, you need to convert your temperatures into the kelvins. So to convert temperature to kelvin, take your Celsius, add 273, and that's your kelvin. Why do we use kelvin instead of Celsius? Mm. No, you can measure pretty hot temperatures with Celsius too. That is true, but what's why is it universal? Why is Kelvin universal? Uh, actually, a lot of people, most people use Celsius. Hey, you rarely hear about yeah, it's about 312 Kelvin outside, um, but usually hear something in Celsius. Why do we have to use Kelvin in our gas calculations? Yes, you're both wrong. Get out of my room now. Uh, no, um, one then two. What do you got? Okay, you're getting there. Yeah, Kelvin has an absolute zero. No, well, Celsius can be pretty exact too. What does Kelvin not have that Celsius does have? Negatives, exactly. Celsius doesn't have, or Kelvin doesn't have negative numbers. So we have to use absolute numbers, so we have to use absolute temperature, and it's, we're going to find that the calculations become impossible when we're using negative temperatures. So anytime you're doing calculations, you need to have your calculations in Kelvin. And by the way, no one's decided if it's Kelvin, like 350 Kelvin, 350 degrees Kelvin, or 350 Kelvins. Doesn't matter. I know it's going to bother you. Some of you are sciencey like me, and you're like, why are they saying Kelvins, like plural Kelvin, like deers? And it's just not the way it is. Okay, so anyway, there's your pressure units, and you need to be able to convert between them. I've tried to sanitize the course to where, to where everything is in atmospheres, but because that is the case, if you're given a pressure that's not in atmospheres, I strongly recommend you convert it to atmospheres. Lane, one more question? Never mind, it's on the board. All right, so any questions about what we've done so far? Before we move on, then off we go. STP. What does STP mean? Start to party. <laughs> Start to party. <laughs> someone last year, someone last class said, "Save the people." Start to party. Okay, well, when you see start the party or save the people, what it means is you are looking at a standard temperature and pressure. Okay, STP is standard temperature and pressure. And standard temperature is zero Celsius or 273 Kelvin. And standard pressure is one atmosphere. So STP is just an easy way of saying one atmosphere, 273 Kelvin. So I put them all on there, but this is all that's really important. SDP, one atmosphere, 273 Kelvin, because the rest is just more atmospheres. Should you find yourself using something besides atmospheres, which is going to happen when you go to AP chemistry or advanced chemistry courses in college, they're not going to give you everything in atmospheres. You'll have to convert things down to atmospheres. Or if you're doing exercises on tutorials and on simulations or on the line, you'll be like, it's going to give you pascals and kilopascals and PSI. I recommend you convert everything to atmospheres. But that's STP. So again, when you see STP, it means one atmosphere pressure, 273 Kelvin. That's what it means. Even though I'm saying this multiple times, when we do our exercises next week, someone's going to say, temperature wasn't given to me. It says at STP. That doesn't mean anything to me. Temperature at STP is just 273 Kelvin. What's pressure? It didn't give me pressure, but it said STP. Oh, that's one atmosphere. Yes, it's one atmosphere. OK, so um, we've done a billion pressure conversions already in the worksheet, but uh, do we need more practice or we should just skip this? More practice, OK. So do temperature conversions. All you do is a little t-chart, pretty simple. So 78 PSI to atmospheres. You do need to memorize how many of a unit is equal to one atmosphere. 
So 78 PSI pound per stupid inch, pound per square inch, is equal to <coughs> atmospheres. So how many PSI is in one atmosphere? 14.7. Good, 14.7. So 14.7 PSI is equal to one atmosphere, and it couldn't be easier. Let's bang on your calculator. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, done. Actually, if you have the yellow calculator, seven, eight, done. 5.3? Is that what we can, is it 5.3? Yeah. yeah. All right. Front row says 5.3, so we'll go with it. 5.3 atmospheres is 78 PSI. Okay, cool. Give me a thumbs up if you understand what just happened. All right, mostly there, okay. So, 630 millimeters of mercury to atmospheres. Start the same way. 630 millimeters of mercury and we're converting to one atmosphere. In one atmosphere, how many millimeters of mercury are there? 760 millimeters of mercury. Did I give you a good enough analogy to understand what the millimeter of mercury is? For those who were not here, the millimeter of mercury is how much liquid mercury can be driven up a glass tube when the atmosphere pushes down. So the atmosphere pushes down and liquid mercury comes up. Yep, and yep, hey, hey. two for two. Okay, so to convert 760 millimeters of mercury, <coughs> 0.83, all right. Front row says 0.83, what do you, what do you think, other rows? Yeah. All right, pretty simple. Now sometimes you're not gonna go to atmospheres, you're gonna go to something else. Let's skip over number three and go to number four. 34 PSIs to Pascals. When you're doing that, the same system applies, 34 PSI, but now you're not gonna to convert to pass, uh, atmospheres are gonna convert to Pascals in that there is still 14.7 PSI and a Pascal is 101,000 Pascals. Okay, they're still equal to one atmosphere, so they're equal to each other. Since there's 14.7 PSI in an atmosphere, there's 101,000 Pascals in an atmosphere, they're equivalent to each other. T-chart, boom, we're done. T-chart, boom. I'm just gonna round that up to 233,000. Okay. It's even, that is even more numbers than we should use, but it's convenient. I wonder what this means. Are you a student of the quarter? No, that didn't happen yet. Okay. So that's pressure conversions. Your uh, mid-unit mini quiz will be mostly, will have a, quite a bit of pressure conversions on it. But again, pretty easy points. You just need to remember what is equal to an atmosphere. 14.7 PSI, 101,000 Pascals, 760 millimeters of mercury, 30 inches of mercury, and off we go. All right, <coughs> give me a thumbs up if you're with me so far. Okay, any questions before we move on? Then we're moving on, okay. Um, Avogadro is, we, we named that number, that six times 10 to the 23rd thing, we named it for Avogadro. Um, he didn't actually come up with it, but we named it for him because he did some really cool research on gases. Turns out gases were some of the easier things to work with back in the day, hundreds of years ago, when chemistry was just getting its feet. So, uh, chemistry, oh absolutely, yeah. It was, it was, it also has bearings, when it was finding its bearings, when it was just right after it was born. Yeah, chemistry has lots of things like that. So what he found, him and Dalton, um, what they found were if you have six times 10 to the 23rd molecules, or one mole of molecules, it's gonna occupy 22.4 22 liters of space at STP. So at STP, one mole of a gas will occupy 22.4 liters of space.
Now that's significant for a, probably a reason you don't quite realize right now. What that means is, because gas molecules are so far apart, their density is so close together that you can basically treat gases the same. Whether you have a sample of oxygen or a sample of nitrogen, as long as you have the same number of molecules or the same number of moles, you can treat it with the same volume. Okay, they'll occupy the same volume because they're so far apart. A heavy gas like chlorine and a light gas like helium will still occupy the same volume if they have the same number of molecules. It's kind of the opposite of a buffet. Okay? If I went to a buffet and Taylor went to a buffet, we still pay the same, but I eat a lot more. It would be like anyone who goes to the buffet, we all eat the same amount. All gases behave the same because they're so far apart, which is pretty important. But you're probably only going to care about a mole of gas being 22.4 liters. Okay, questions? Does this idea make sense a little bit? Okay. All right, cool. This is my favorite part of the lecture. I got to turn lights on. This is my peeps. I'm going to play with my peeps. I got some peeps. My wife bought me some peeps. Okay, here's my peep. Um, I'm going to put this peep in the microwave. <laughs> now, okay, so peeps don't weigh much. They're, they're not very heavy. Um, they're not very dense. They have a, a shell of sugar, but they're basically marshmallows. Why do peeps not weigh very much? Exactly. There's a lot of air, which makes them fun. Um, so I'm going to put the peep in the microwave for about uh, nine seconds. <coughs> maybe for maybe for only five seconds. Oh, it already blew up. Um, so. If you could see really close, you, you see, you see the, basically the poop, the peep, the poop that goes boop. Um, so it expands because when you increase the temperature of gases, what do they do? Expand. They expand. If you've ever, uh, if you've ever seen or been on a hot air balloon, that's how a hot air balloon works. You heat up the gas, and that causes the gases to expand. Okay, that's Charles' law. Does anybody want the peep? Okay, I saw Rome's hand first. Rome was paying attention. Styrofoam? No. Ice cream. Like the cheap ice cream. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yep. it's whipped. That's the whole point of whipping things. Yeah. Yep. I kind of like the cheap ice cream. All right. So that's Charles' Law. Charles' Law expresses what happens to the volume of a gas when it changes pressure. And we usually show, by the way, if you want to call him uh, Charles, that's great. If you want to call him Jacques Charlet, even better. Charles. If you want to call him Mr. Dr. Chuck, that would be fine. Um, we we'll usually just call it Charles' Law because we speak English. And uh, we usually show Charles' Law as a relationship between the volume and temperature of gas at one situation and the volume and temperature of a gas at another situation. But again, temperature must be in Kelvin. For those who are having a little trouble seeing the, the conceptual idea of the formula, it's kind of like, I'm going to go ahead and turn the lights back on so we can do calculations. It's kind of like the peep in the room temperature had a volume of one and a temperature of one. And then we heated up the peep and the temperature got bigger. And since there's an equal sign, that required the volume to get bigger. So just like two over two is equal to five over five, make sense? This idea makes sense? Okay. So as we increase the temperature, we increase the volume. 
That's Charles' law. Okay. Questions? So it's Kelvin because why? So it's never negative. So if you put a negative number in there, you'd get a negative volume. So if you said, and you cooled it down to negative 10 degrees, and you made this negative, that would mean your volume would also have to be negative. And you can't have a negative volume. So we have to use absolute temperature, which is a Kelvin scale. It's a good question. Any other questions before we do some practice? You got your calculators warmed up? All right, here we go. If a balloon holding 4.8 liters of gas at 21 degrees is cooled to negative 18 degrees, what will be the new volume? So write down your formula and then plug in the numbers into your formula. So our formula is going to be V1 over T1, oops, T1 equals V2 over T2. And then plug in the numbers to that formula. V1 is going to be 4.8 liters. T1 is going to be whatever 21 plus 273 is. 294? 294 Kelvin. And then we want to know what V2 is, so that's our variable. And T2 is going to be whatever negative 18 is plus 273. 255. 255. See, can you see now if this was negative, that would make V negative? And then we solve for V2. Yes? No. We're doing Kelvin because Celsius is something we made up. Kelvin is something that is absolute. It, it, there is no negatives in the Kelvin. Okay. So Celsius is just something we made up to make our numbers easier. But the Kelvin scale is an absolute scale. It's no negative, so it, it works no matter what. So you just add 273 to the temperature? Yes. Yeah. If it's Yes. Should you find yourself in a situation where you have to use Fahrenheit, you do need to convert your Fahrenheit into Kelvin or Fahrenheit to Celsius to Kelvin. I'm not a big fan of Fahrenheit. I don't think very most science teachers are. But should you find yourself in the, the classroom of a torturous chemistry teacher in college who likes to use Fahrenheit because he hates people, then, uh, you know, you might, you're going to encounter a sociopath somewhere that still wants to use Fahrenheit. I would just ask Alexa, but Alexa's not working today. Wait, Alexa? Did Alexa lose your voice? <laughs> Is Sorry, I don't know that. Oh, it logged in. Cool. So, Alexa, what is 45 Fahrenheit converted to Kelvin? 45 degrees Fahrenheit is 280.37 Kelvin. It, it, was, it hasn't worked all week. It has a little red ring, and now it's on. You had to say it was... I know. Did Alexi, did you lose your voice? <laughs> yes, that was, that was quite possibly one of the dumbest commercials next to the Peter Dinklage Doritos commercial. What is that? You have to watch the Super Bowl. The what? That was okay. Everything's a tight head. Look how clean that is. Okay, so what is V2? 4.2 liters? Okay, so it's important, guys, to, uh, it's important for us to basically ask ourselves if that number makes sense. So the balloon is being cooled. If something is cooled, we would expect its volume to do what? Decrease. Decrease. Is 4.2 less than 4.8? Yes. Awesome. Okay, I think another one's the same kind of deal, new volume. Let's skip over that one and go to this one. If a three liter sample of air at 41 degrees is heated until it has a volume of 4.2 liters, to what temperature was it heated? I'll be behind you in a few minutes. See if you can work this one out on your own. Yeah, Celsius to Kelvin is adding 273. 
Oh, I plugged in my ozone maker. I should have told you. It's over there. I plugged in my ozone maker. If you wanna, if you've never smelled ozone in the air, I have a, a lightning bolt maker over here. At the risk of frying my uh, microwave or microphone. Still on. Still on. I have to do it back there because if I did it up here, there's a good chance the uh, the GFIs would pop and then the projector would turn off. If you don't have a Tesla coil, I strongly recommend picking one up. All right, V1 over T1 equals V2 over T2. V1 is 3.0 liters. T1 is whatever 41 plus 273 is. 314? 314 Kelvin. And V2 is going to be the 4.2 liters. And we're solving for T2. Does anyone need more time? Okay, what did you get for T2? I got 440. All right. Sounds good. I would have rounded up too. So 440 Kelvin. Does that sound right? About right. Okay. Now the question that you're probably thinking, or will think in the next five seconds or so, is, do we need to convert that back to a Celsius? Um, and the question is, sometimes, sometimes you do. Um, and if you do, how do you convert something back to Celsius? Minus Just take it. This subtract. So what is that in degrees Celsius? 167. 167? So 440 is 167 Celsius? Man, that's hot. It is. It's hot, hot, hot. Okay. How do you feel about this pressure temperature stuff? Bueno. Bueno? Okay. Question. Okay. Um, that's an excellent, excellent point. So it depends upon what math technique you want to use. If you want to cross multiply, that's probably going to be your best bet. Just multiply what you have and divide what you don't. Remember cross multiplying? So 314 times 4.2 divided by 3. That's probably going to be your best bet. If you want, you can multiply both sides by T2 and then multiply both sides by 314 and get a longer equation. That also works. So whichever algebra technique you want to use, the answer is going to be the same. So if you multiply both sides by T2, multiply both sides by 314, you're golden. Or you can cross multiply 314 times 4.2 divided by 3.0. Cool? Shall we move on? All right. OK, so I got a, I got a, a vacuum chamber up here. This is, a, this is basically just a plastic container and a vacuum pump. So sucks in, pushes out. And uh, it's not an excellent vacuum pump. Um, if anyone wants to uh, buy me something cool, a better vacuum pump would be great. But I'm going to put a peep in the vacuum pump. And what the vacuum pump is going to do is it's going to, hopefully, suck out most of the air, causing the pressure in the container to go up or down. Yeah, if there's less molecules, the pressure should go down. down. Remember, pressure comes from molecules hitting into things. So molecules are bang, 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 bang. If you take away most of the molecules, there's less bang, bang, bang. Okay. So um, I'm going to go ahead and turn on the pump. As the gas is removed, the pressure is going down. So the volume is going up. Oh, here's, for reference, here's the, uh, the unaltered peep. Okay. Here's my favorite part. Now it's really sad. Yeah, now it's, now it's peep jerky, because a, be, a lot of the air on the outside has been removed. Anybody want some peep jerky? 
Okay, I saw the, I saw Hannah's up for uh, it's Kaylee's a hand up first. Callie's <laughs> hand up first. <laughs> You can char. You can char it. All right. So uh, the takeaway from that, guys. <laughs> the takeaway from that was as the pressure went, the volume went up. So pressure.